My name is Trenton Schultz and I'm a senior software engineer here at Qt Software and today I want to talk to you about the uh, Qt Mac port using Coco as its back end. So I'll try to give you some background first. This is really kind of a story of three libraries. So our first library that we're going to meet is called Carbon. And Carbon was the original, uh, was, is kind of the background of the original toolbox that was used to design uh, Mac programming or Mac applications back in the day before Mac OS X. But it also has a lot of new features as well. And Carbon loves C. So it's a C-based library. The next library we're going to meet is called Coco. Now Coco kind of comes from the next step world. And Coco loves Objective-C. Objective-C is a uh, object-oriented, uh, uh, basically object-oriented extensions to the C programming language. Then finally, we'll talk a little bit, or finally, we have our hero, Qt. And, you know, Qt loves C++. So C++, of course, if you're watching this and, and aren't quite sure, is, of course, another object-oriented extension to the C programming language. And since Qt loves C++, and C++ is really easy to build on top of C, naturally, of course, Qt loves Coco, or fell in love with Coco in the beginning. And uh, they had a lot of little children. These are the various uh, minor releases of Qt that it came out that were using Carbon. And this is all well and good, and from time to time we try to go to the, uh, the developer conference and find out what's going on. And in 2006, we found out that uh, the big plan was to go for 64-bit Carbon and Coco. And we thought, that's a good idea. You know, 64-bit applications can be useful for people who, who need them. Um, so let's go ahead and get Carbon going so, and get it working in 64-bit. There were certain libraries that you didn't use, but certain ones you could use instead. So we started working on it and seeing what we could do. And we were, you know, by the time middle of 2007 rolled around, we were pr in pretty good shape as far as having a 64-bit Carbon version working. And then we'd go to www. DC feeling that we're in pretty good shape and well there's a bit of a surprise you see there's no more 64-bit Coco and Carbon it's just 64-bit Coco so well needless to say we were just uh, a bit surprised not quite sure what we would do so we started thinking about it and you know now you're here it's 2008 and what you might be wondering does Qt love Coco? And I'm here today to tell you that yes, Qt does indeed love Coco. Now you may be asking, why? Why even go about making a new version of Qt when you still have a version of Carbon that still works? Well, the primary reason that we came up with was having a 64-bit platform. Um, Basically, 64-bit, especially on Intel processors, is a, a good thing to have. You have, um, first of all, you can uh, access much more data than you could in the 32-bit world. So if you are pulling in MRI scans that are, you know, basically 12 gigabytes to start with or editing video, um, you, you bump up against the 32-bit 32, uh, 32 level very fairly quickly and having 64-bit just allows you just to forget about having to worry about all these offsets and everything. Also, uh, as I was tr going to mention, if you're on the Intel architecture, you have more registers that are available for you. So your code might see a bit of a speed up because it doesn't have to be constantly throwing data between memory and the computer all the time. I'm going to say potential. This doesn't always, isn't always the case. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do was also integrate better with Mac OS X technologies. And I'll try to show a couple of examples of that later on during this. Um, basically, since about 2005 or so, there's been kind of a signal from Apple that 
they were when they were developing their newer technologies they were going to be objective C based and they would probably work in carbon but you would have to learn some objective C now as time has gone on the new technologies have only been cocoa based and people who have been using carbon have not really been able to take advantage of those so being able to we also wanted customers because we know that there are a fair number of, of our customers that like to use plugins or develop plugins for their for other applications and to be able to use all the technologies that are available on Mac OS 10 is a good another good thing to uh, have and also we wanted to keep Qt working for the future now that carbon is kind of on a uh, maintenance path it didn't seem like it it would seem that at some point in the future there actually might be a version of Mac OS 10 um, that doesn't really have carbon anymore or nearly the same level of carbon support so we kind of wanted to you know get on the correct bandwagon and you know have a cute that works well into the future and our final thing was to kind of keep our cross-platform promise I mean today you can build a 64-bit application for Linux or X11 machine for Windows it seemed kind of silly that you couldn't build a 64-bit application for Mac OS 10 even though the technology is there so that was our other goal was to kind of keep our cross-platform promise so I've told you the reasons you know why we, we did the uh, port but now you might be wondering how do we actually get it well of course you get it through the snapshots and you can go to our website I'll give the address at the end of the presentation um, and download the latest snapshots for Qt 4.5 and you'll have Coco built in or you'll have all the source code for Coco and you can take a look at it and you know let us know how what needs to work and stuff but of course building Coco starts with starts on the command line and using the configure program to configure Qt to build it correctly now we know that Coco is a new technology or our new a new way of using Qt and we know that there are a lot of people out, out there who have already written their program on the Mac to use carbon and they don't necessarily want to have all these surprises that happen when they first build Qt uh, for for four or five so we aren't going to put Cocoa on by default it's something that you're going to have to opt in so if you configure Qt the exact same way you configured Qt for 4.4 you will get the exact same options and it will be running carbon and 32-bit so the first thing you might want to do um, the thing that we have added um, that was actually added back around 4.3 but never really showed up was the possibility that you can pass multiple architectures on the configure line um, you might know in past we had something called minus universal that's still there and that will still work exactly the same as it has before which is that it will build an x86 and a PowerPC um, version of Qt but you can pass multiple architectures on the command line so you can also pass the 64-bit architectures and those will build a 64-bit version of Qt and by default the versions that are done um, you will get uh, the x86 and PowerPC will both be carbon based and the 64-bit um, versions x86-64 and PowerPC-64 will be using Coco. now some of you people might be really daring and you might or you might feel that like you really just want everything to be pure Coco, and you can do that by passing minus Coco on the configure line when you do that your final result will be that everything is using Coco. Now this is all well and good, but you have to realize that there are some restrictions if you are building everything all Coco. Some of these restrictions are that it's Leopard only. It will not work on Mac OS X or earlier versions of the operating system. So if you, if you can require Leopard and above, then you should really consider trying to give Coco a shot. There's also no Qt 3 support. 
when we when it came time to do the Coco port, we kind of looked at things that we could do, and and things that made sense to not take over. And one of the things that we thought was Qt3 support. We feel that if you're willing to target a new platform and uh, you know require have new requirements, it's time for you to take a look at your code and start to port it over to using Qt4 and not using the Qt3 support class libraries. I've done this myself in the past for some applications, so I know that there is some pain involved. But at the end of the day, it's a it's a much better experience. Um, one other thing that we don't have right now, or that's not currently supported, is the idea of building static libraries. Um, the main reason for this is because of how nibs are used. Um, basically, in Coco, you have to load a nib in order to get the main menu, uh, the menu bar in Mac OS X to even work. And um, currently, without having to, uh, with, we aren't changing um, the architecture of QMake, especially much in this release, um, there's a lot of requirements that would have to happen in order to put the nib into your application bundle. So for the moment, we are not required, or we don't want, um, we aren't uh, having static as a supported option. However, we have added something called the Mac Deploy Qt tool that's included with Qt. And this is a tool that will help you deploy your applications onto other platforms or onto other Macs. And this will do a lot of the dirty work that you had to do before by hand that's all documented in the Mac Deployment Guide. And we feel that you know, having the ability to use the Mac Deployment Tool should ease any problems that you had before of having to use static before. And there's one final limitation that exists for the moment um, that isn't something that we plan on addressing as time goes by, and that is we didn't get the accessibility module ported over to use Coco. Um, this is a fairly large task. Um, it's not impossible. It's just that it's something that requires time and we haven't gotten uh, everything working for that yet. So for the time being, we've disabled it. So now that I've talked a bit about why we've done it, what and sort of the restrictions that you have to use if you're planning on using Coco. Let me talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we actually tried to fix up. Because one of the nice things about working on this was that we were able to fix some of the annoyances that, you know, have existed in the Mac port for a long time. And we're pretty we're pretty happy with what we've come up with and I hope that you have a chance to take a look at the new things. So first of all you might remember this font dialog that we've had before in the past. Um, it's not exactly native. So we decided to kill it and we now have a native QFont dialog available. Um, that's part of some dialog changes that I'll be talking about in, in a little bit. We also wanted it to make, be much easier to make sheets easy to use. Um, in the past, what you've, you've kind of had to jump through several hoops to get sheets to work as, a, as you would expect. Um, and basically that's, that's to have them work window modal, to have them not block the application event loop and, and things like that. So we wanted to make it much easier for you to use sheets and that when you wrote, code, when you wrote your code to be using sheets, it wouldn't be that out of place inside of the other platform on other platforms. And uh, finally, we wanted to integrate better with the event loop. We know that there are a lot of people out there who are writing plugins. And in the current, as in the current iteration of Qt, there are times when we would post internal Qt events into our own event loop, and we would need from some, somebody from time to time to flush these events and get them over. Now, normally this is handled during when you call queue application exec. However, when you're running as a plugin, you don't necessarily have control of the event loop. So in Coco, or in Qt 4.5, both Carbon and Coco have a much more hands-off approach to the event loop, which basically means it doesn't matter who is running the event loop, you will get your Qt events, your Coco events, and your Carbon events. So hopefully that will make it you know, much easier for plugin writers to get their job done. So as I was talking about, we want to make sheets 
and uh, things easier to use. So we created a, a way, uh, new ways of running your dialogue. Now the first two you're probably already familiar with. One is Queue Dialogue Exec, of course. And this is an application modal, of, modal way of running your dialogue. And eventually it will return. It won't return until somebody has pressed OK and Cancel, and then you will get the value of Queue Dialogue done, or that's gotten from Queue Dialogue done. This is OK. And of course, you probably also know about Queue Dialogue Show. In general, its modality is none, but of course, if you want to play with set window modality, you can get it to whatever modality you want. And uh, the difference is QDialog show will return immediately, so uh, you know you can continue processing on. Now, but sometimes you might just want to actually just run a sheet, and you just want to kind of fire off and forget, and you just want to get the result later. And what we've done is created a new function called QDialog open. Now this is a window modal by default, and it will return immediately. And what you do when you use um, Queue Dialog open is that you connect to the slots that you've implemented, or connect to uh, signals that are emitted from the dialog, and do the rest of your processing later. And uh, I'll kind of give a, an example of how this works by taking a quick look at Queue Color Dialog. So this is Cube Color Dialog that I have uh, it's basically been redone, and this is a testing application that we wrote. Um, so first of all, you understand probably exec new dialog. That will just call exec as it normally has, and you have to select a color before you can uh, continue on. Um, another thing that we've added is that you don't necessarily have to use the native dialogs. So I can, for example, here say I don't want to use the native dialog. And then what I'm going to do is call open. And what you'll see is an open is that it has opened a sheet. Now this can be useful because I can go back here and I can call open again and I can get another sheet. And the whole point here is that I can have multiple sheets open because they're all window modal. So I can do my uh, color selection here and be done with it whereas this one still is waiting for a color selection. So this makes it much easier to create sheets when you're doing your, uh, when you're doing your work. And then finally, the last thing I want to show that kind of makes it much easier to use is we've also added for Q color dialog an example of you, you don't need to have the OK and cancel buttons. And you can just call show. So you'll see here we actually have a native Q color dialog here. And you can see as I pick different colors, the uh, output is brought back to the current color selected in, uh, in the controller over here. And this is kind of a nice way that works for how, how many applications work on Mac OS X as far as selecting your color and uh, fonts and, and things like that, that they just end up getting immediate feedback. And when people don't want this anymore, they simply close the dialog down. So these are the ways you kind of work with things now. Um, in this, in the showcase, in the in the showcase here, what I what I should have pointed out is that when somebody is is choosing a color down here, it will emit a signal called current color, which will get filtered back into this dialog, which is listening for it. And if you would have an OK and cancel button down here, when you hit OK, it would emit the signal for selected color. If you hit cancel, you get no color. So that's the new way of using dialogs in an example of using cue color dialog. So hopefully that will be a nice new way to be able to do things um, when you're designing your dialogs. And another nice thing that this uh, kind of gives you is the fact that you don't need uh, to use the static functions anymore. So you don't need, to, so instead of using a static function like q file dialog colon colon get open file name, which couldn't really work as a sheet, even though we kind of cheated on it in, back in the days, now you just simply create a q file dialog as you wanted before, call open on it, and then later listen to the signal of file selected. 
and do what you need to do from there. And, this, and the nice thing is, is that if you decide to create your own way of doing things, you can simply replace it and the metaphor will work. You don't have to like, make up a static function. So we've, we've created this new way of doing things and it will, you know, it's a good substitute for using the static functions. So please consider in your new code using this new metaphor for designing dialogues. And of course, I should mention, this is available on all platforms. We've had a couple of people go through and make it work on all the platforms. So it's a good thing to, uh, it's, it, you don't even have to if-def your code. It will just work out of the box. The next feature I want to talk about is QMAC Cocoa Container. Now, um, QMAC Cocoa Container is a class that is used for um, taking an existing view or uh, from Cocoa, such as a, a web view or a, a PDF view or, or things like that, and putting it into a Qt hierarchy. This is uh, handy because sometimes there might be features inside of Qt that we don't have yet, but Coco has a view that already does it, and you just want to take it and put it into your um, widget hierarchy. And in the past, it was possible to do this. You needed to do a little bit of work, but it's not too bad. So what I'm going to do is uh, show an example here. Um, but there's going to be some Objective-C involved. And I don't know if everybody out there is familiar with an Objective-C. So here's a very, very quick crash course. Um, basically, Objective-C is, is object-oriented. And if you know how object orientation works in C++, you know that you have your object and you have a little arrow thing usually because the thing is on the heap, not on the stack. And you call some method and you pass some arguments, arg1 and arg2, for example. Well, in Coco, it's not that much different. You have an object, and then you have a space, and then you have some method, and then you, with a description of arg1, and then a description of arg2. And you use the um, brackets to indicate the, uh, the statement, to indicate the message passing. So the object here, or so the thing on the left is always the object, and the thing on the right is the method that's being called. So it's not too difficult. And with that, I'd like to give a very simple example of uh, using QCOCO container. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this program called COCO Slides. Now COCO Slides is a program that exists on, uh, that it's just a simple example that you can download from uh, the uh, Apple developer website. And it's just an example of using, uh, using core animation. So you can see that there was some animation when things go in. You can move the slides around yourself, or you can like choose different ways to arrange the slides. And it does all this stuff. You can turn on shadows. You can turn on a quartz composer background if you really feel like it. And I mean, this is just a straight Coco application. And you might be thinking, like, well, that's pretty cool. Maybe I want to put something like this inside my Qt application. And uh, that's certainly a possibility. And you can start by writing it yourself and using core animation directly now. Now that, Qt, um, now that Qt is using Coco, you can use core animation directly on your views. And you don't have to wait for an animation framework, or for our animation framework. You can do it today. Of course, you're only limited on Mac OS X, but maybe that's good enough for you. Um, but at the same time, wouldn't you also like you know, to just be able to take the application and run it? Or take a view, take a view that's already been pre-made and run it. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to use QMAC Coco View Container for it. So this is my header file that I've created. And uh, basically, I'm using this as a subclass of QMAC Coco View, because that way I can have some add my own functions and stuff. 
So basically I've added slots, which are kind of my way of dealing with uh, interacting with the uh, Coco view. And then I have a uh, pointer to the various um, objects that I'm going to be using. Now in the implementation, it's not that much different. I just uh, pass a parent widget. Um, I create my Q Coco view controller. Um, the control that we were dealing with uh, that was doing all the animations before is called an asset collection view. And all I'm going to do is allocate it and init it with a uh, frame. So basically set the size. And then I'm going to call set Coco view on it. And this will tell QMAC Coco view container to wrap this view. And then, yes, and then down here I just set off a single ti shot timer for browsing for slides. But um, as you can see down here, and then of course in our, uh, yeah, and then of course in our uh, destructor I release the collection view. And these slot, and basically the functions down here are basically just wrapping um, functionality from Qt and passing it along to the asset collection view and the asset collection. And same for doing the animations and everything. All this stuff is basically just a pass through down. So people who are using my uh, class don't necessarily have to know the objective C code. So let's, if everything is going well, you'll see that presto, the things are in, in there exactly. And uh, I can use my own thing down here to scatter things, loop them. I can turn on shadows again. I can turn on the uh, quartz background. And things work exactly as they were as if they were just a Coco application. But now I've taken this, I can use it, you know, show off people, and, you know, it works just like a normal cute widget. So that's Mac Coco View or Coco View Container, and I'll say it also works with Carbon. Uh, however, it requires 10.5, but you can use this in Carbon if you need to. So the next widget I want to talk to you about is QMac Native Widget, and this kind of is the exact opposite of what QMac Coco Container is. QMAC native widget will allow you to take, <coughs> excuse me, to take a Qt widget and transplant it into a Coco or Carbon hierarchy. Now this can be handy for, again, for plugin development, or if you have a window but you don't necessarily have a Qt window and you want to be able to put Qt hierarchies in. Now I will warn you that this is kind of a advanced experts only class and that when you do this, you're going to have to be doing a lot of the work on your own. But we help you out in getting the Qt hierarchy set up for you so you can at least have things working there. It works in Carbon or Coco. It doesn't matter which one. And I'm going to give you a very, very, very simple example of how you can use it. Okay, so here's a very simple example that's actually taken from our documentation on QMAC native view, but it's very simple and it helps show the point. Now, again, you just start out by creating a Q application. Um, you need to create a Q application if you're going to create any Q widgets. And I'm just going to show you the Coco way of doing this. Now you'll see lots of crazy boilerplate Coco code. Um, that's okay. Um, this is kind of just to help emphasize how much of an expert's class it is that you need to know. So we start out by creating an auto-release pool for our auto-release objects. If you don't know what auto-release objects are, you can look it up in the Coco documentation. Um, we then create a Coco window. And you could have, for example, taken this from a nib, but I'm just trying to use, I, I'm just trying to create it from code because that's what leech programmers would do. I then create our, uh, yes, there we go. I then create a, a native QMAC native widget. I move it to zero, zero, and the main reason because of this is that when 
the widget gets placed inside of the hierarchy in Coco, Coco will not change the geometry. So by saying that I want it to be at 0, 0, this helps move it to the 0, 0 point in the window. I then create the palette and make it red, just because I want people to uh, see what's going on. Um, I then create a layout. Now one thing that you might need to be aware of is that when you're creating your QMAC native widget and you're putting it inside of a Coco and a Carbon hierarchy, you are not going to have the same cute layouts that you have normally. So this might be a problem, it might not. Um, that's something that you need to be aware of and you might need to be using the Coco or Carbon mechanisms to do your layout or doing it in a resize or something like that. But I can use layouts on the widgets below me. So, for the, so I create my layout, I create a Q push button, I give the native widget as, as its parent, I, for uh, the layout uh, pedants out there, I've set the layout to use the widget rect instead of the, uh, the rect that's given, it to, given to us by QMAC style. I then add my push button to the layout, and then I set the layout on the native widget. Then, what I do down here is adjust the Coco layouts so that when I resize the widget, everything works along with it. Um, so everything will resize with it. So here we are with our native widget. I'm going to pull out the win ID for it, which is actually, of course, an NSView pointer. When you have the NSView pointer, you know, you can uh, I'll also grab the NSView pointer for the content view of the window. And I set up sort of the auto resizing flags, how it should be auto resized. Um, things like that. And then finally, I add the widget, the native widget to the window by using content view, add sub view, adding the nat native widget view. Since the push button is already a child of the native widget, there's nothing else I need to do. I then call show on the widgets because of course they're added to the new window um, hidden. Then I simply show the window and release my pool. And, if we do everything correctly, you'll see that we have a Coco window with an embedded QT button. And you can resize it, and you can see that the resize works correctly. So that's basically it on how you use QMAC native widget. And I, as I said, it works for both Carbon and Coco. And we are using it internally when we want to place widgets inside of the menu bar. So that's basically it. We've, come, we've uh, gone through all the basics here. Um, this is a very quick sum up. I want to just let you know that Coco is now indeed an option for Qt on Mac OS X, and you can use it yourself. It's a great way if you want to get to 64-bit on Mac OS X. I don't think that, I, I think it's worth thinking about if you want to always go to 64-bit. Um, sometimes a 32-bit application is just as fine. You don't use as much memory and you might not need that to address that big a data set. So there's nothing wrong with keeping your applications 32-bit. Um, but the other advantage you get if you go to Coco is you get better integration with technologies. Um, so if you want to use things like core animation or core video or core image, all these new technologies that have come with Mac OS X, um, Coco is a much better way of getting access to them. Though we do have a way with the QMAC Coco View container to get your own widgets back, or to get the Coco widgets into a carbon hierarchy. Um, there's a new way of using dialogues that's available on all platforms. And it was developed during the Coco port, and I really want to see lots of new code using your new applications using this code. So please consider looking at that. Again, all this is available in the Qt 4.5 snapshots. So please check it out. The address is over here on the, on the slide. I'd like you to try it out and give us feedback. The email address, of course, is cute for preview feedback at trolltech.com. So thank you, and uh, I hope you enjoy it.